Hello and welcome to the Fighting Spur Podcast. As always, I'm Jason. I'm here to bring us the fight picks for Roizenstruck vs. Gone, and we're going to look back at Blades vs. Lewis, where we went 7 and 5, 58.33% accuracy. Did okay overall, but really crapped out on the Patreon there. We actually didn't get any of those picks right. Uh, just didn't go our way. Let's get into it, though. Here's the show. <laughs> All right, we're going to start out with the recap here, where we did get the main event. Derek Lewis knocks out brutally Curtis Blades. Curtis Blades said he was going to wrestle up and down, put his wrestling shoes on, and make Derek Lewis his bitch, but he was not able to score any takedowns in the fight. He was stuffed, and in fact, honestly, Blades striking actually looked halfway decent. It was his wrestling that got him into trouble. Shooting for that very telegraph takedown is what gave it to Lewis. Lewis's game plan was basically look for one big shot. He knows he has the power to cripple any man out there and that's what he did he played possum hung back ate some decent shots from lewis and then when it was time to wrestle it was time for him to throw an uppercut and knock Derek. sorry knock curtis blades the f out blades was out before he hit the canvas and then he picked up two additional strikes before herb dean could jump in there making my balls as hot Derek lewis one of the hot picks of the night and I was very happy to make that call. Also, 50 G's baby, Derek Lewis getting the performance money along with Chris Dockhouse, Tom Aspinall, Eamon Zahabi, and yeah, that runs us out for performances. Moving on to the next one, Yana Kutinskaya upsets us here. We had gone out and picked Caitlin Vieira, but Vieira was not able to do much more than score three takedowns. Hardly any strikes really landed. Uh, Yana Kutinskaya just was able to actually... Am- create action on the ground, right? Kelton Vieira would get her there, right? She had a lot of control time, but how much damage did she actually end up inflicting? Very little. And honestly, I thought it could have gone to Vieira just because of that control time, but you have to be active in there. You cannot be looking for stalemates or draws, and I feel like that's where Ketlin was looking for, whereas every time Kutinskaya had an opportunity to shut the door, she went for it. So much so that she ended up in top position in the third round, in a round that honestly was probably sealed up for Vieira, and punched her way to victory. You cannot overlook action like that, and I think this was the right call, although it did hurt to have this call not go our way because it was one of the Patreon picks. It just is what it is. And the next one, Derek Miner defeats Charles Rosa. And this one here, I'm guilty of overlooking Miner's jiu-jitsu when compared to Rosa's. You know, Rosa said he was a black belt, said he could hang with him. Uh, the numbers seemed to back that up. But ultimately, Miner made him his bitch on the ground and really was throwing a lot of high-level MMA jiu-jitsu at him. And Rosa was never looking confident. He kept pulling a lot of guard. He was working off of his back and he was making attempts. But from a pure, you know, if I don't get the submission, who's going to win the fight perspective. Miner was on top position all day, scoring a lot of shots, outstriking him, four, sorry, three to one, and it was really uh, just a one-sided affair with Miner, just scoring takedowns, holding him there all round, and chaining submissions together, passes, sweeps, you name it. Miner was outdoing Rosa everywhere Boston Strong was. In the next one, I said big titties wouldn't get it done. Well, I was wrong. Chris Dockhouse gets it done. And, uh, well, I'm just, hey, i got to eat crow on this one. I put my foot in my mouth. I thought Alexi Olenek was going to be able to choke him out, and he tried, but uh, Olenek's striking looks really bad these days. I think the fact of the matter is Olenek is just in an advanced age, and his average statistics are not really where he's at today. So going by his stats, he's not able to live up to them anymore. He's a little bit of a shell of himself. And while he could still get some wins, I'm sure, I think the best of Olenek is honestly behind him, and it just is what it is. Uh, He only lands five strikes. The Dock House is 34, and uh, really, really, honestly, was pretty one-sided. Olenek did try to go for a couple of chokes, did try to get him to the map, but Dock House wasn't having it and punched his way to victory. uh, Minute 55 seconds. And the next one, not much to say here, but Phil Haas does get it done about against Nasruddin Imovov. The story here is takedowns. That was a pretty middling affair with a majority decision, but it could have honestly gone to a draw. So hats off to Phil Haas for squeaking by on that one and saving one of our picks. The next one we got correct as well. Tom Aspinall defeats Andre Olovsky. Um, what had to be one of the quickest rear naked choke tap-ups I've ever seen. Uh, just like Arlovsky knew where he was. He knew he couldn't fight out of it. 
And, uh, you know, his fight IQ just said, hey, man, live the fight another day. And he ended up tapping out almost immediately after Aspinall gets the back after shooting him with a Goldberg-like spear in the second round. Uh, but Arlovsky had moments here. You know, Aspinall rides on his chin. He had a couple of good shots. He wasn't really phased by it, but he's young enough in his career where he can still eat some of those, whereas Arlovsky can't. He had to cover up a lot when Aspinall was throwing. And, uh, well, ultimately it gets done on the ground, not a place I think a lot of us had figured it would go. Uh, moving on to the next one, Jared Gordon, uh, one we did get incorrect. This was another Patreon one. Uh, Jared Gordon just smashes Danny Chavez. I thought Danny Chavez was going to hang a little bit better, but I'd struck two to one and uh, just not a good fight. The next one we got correct, John Castaneda defeats Eddie Wineland. Wineland's a husk of himself. I mean, he looked good. Uh, going in, you know, he was making a lot of movements. He, he looked like, uh, uh, you know, the fighting Irishman from Notre Dame. He was, looked like he was bare knuckle boxer out there. I think it's mostly the mustache, uh, but he was out there dancing around, moving. And, but when he, once he caught a couple of good ones to the to the chin, uh, he quickly crumbled and uh, fell like a sack of shit. And that was all we had to write. Castaneda gets it done. He would not be bullied in there. And sexy Mexi walks away with a big W for him in his 44 seconds. Next one, Julian Arosa does pick up a win for us. He defeats Nate Landwehr. Not much to say here. Flying knee knocks out Landwehr. And uh, 56 seconds in, that's all she wrote. Juicy J. Arosa walks out with the win. Casey O'Neill, the next one, defeats Shayna Dobson. She is your next ladies flyweight hype train, I think, because she is sexy as hell. And she's going out there kicking ass, picking up a knockout. TKO punches. The second round, 3 minutes, 41 seconds. She looked amazing out there. Great takedown game, great striking game. A way to make your debut if there ever was one. And then the last two here, Eamon Zahabi. I did not expect him to catch him, but uh, he caught Draco Rodriguez an overhand right and knocked him out. I still think that Zahabi is overrated in the UFC, but he picks up a win, and uh, you just got to accept it. Picks up performance of the night money as well. Then the last one here, Sergey Spivak pretty easily uh, defeats Jared Vandadera, and this is one we did get correct. Uh, Spivak knocks him out. Four minutes, 32 seconds into round number two. So like I said, we went seven and five. We did okay overall. We really kind of crapped out once we get to the main event, missing three in a row with Dockhouse, Minor, and Kutinskaya. It's like we were cruising pretty good up until that point and only missed a couple. Uh, but, uh, you know, hey, is what it is. That is MMA for us. It's unpredictable. And uh, honestly, if you asked me if I thought Derek Lewis was going to win after round one, I probably would have said no. But hey, sometimes you pick him up even when you think you are not. All right. So... Let's move on to the next one. Let's talk about Roizenstruck versus Gunn. All right, so at the time I'm recording this, it looks like some fights are still coming together. Uh, there are a couple of fighters that fell off. So right now, Marcelo Rojo and Alex Hernandez. Oh, sorry, no. Alex Oliveira do not have dance partners right now, so we're not able to talk about them. Uh, so we'll cover this as best we can, but know that uh, whatever the final picks are for this one, it could end up changing a little bit uh, because this card isn't quite finalized. It's just been a reality of COVID. The fights have changed uh, sort of moment to moment, as you guys are all well aware of. Anyways, let's talk about the main event. Jorginho Rosenstruck versus Cyril Gaon. In this one here, I think it's gone all day. This guy is a total complete mixed martial artist. He has submission game. He has phenomenal striking. He trains with Francis Ngannou. And he's a guy, I think, that can go ahead and rival Ngannou. Now, they're in the same camp, on the same team. You know, I, I don't know what the reality of them fighting each other will be in the future, but he's about to make a statement here. Three KOs, three submissions over seven wins. The guy is a physical specimen. And while we have seen Roizenstruck come back, you know, and beat guys like Overeem, you know, holding that one-punch knockout power, I think that Gon will be too much to deal with. However, just like we saw with Derek Lewis last week, the power in the right hand can always be there. It can always change things. But I think your best bet is to stick with Gon on this one. He's the more complete mixed martial artist. And short of a Hail Mary of a shot, it's going to be Gon all day. He's the pick in the main event. All right, moving on to the next one here. We have Nikita, the minor Krylov, taking on Magomed Ankalaev. And in this one here, I think it's Ankalaev all day. Besides this guy getting caught in a triangle show, a choke from Paul Craig, he has been a wrecking machine. Back to back knockouts of Ion Kudaleba, knocked out uh, Dalcha Magula, 
docked out Marcin Burchino, and I think he's going to be knocking out the minor, honestly, on Saturday. You know, this guy has had some trouble performing. He got a split decision loss to Glover Deshera, was choked out by Jan Blakovic, and while he did defeat Johnny Walker and Ovin St. Pru, I think Ankalaev is the real deal. This guy is dangerous everywhere. He has some heavy, great takedown game. Mostly, he does strike his way to victory, but the ground and pound is there. Nine knockouts over 14 wins. This is an easy one for me. We're sticking with the Russian Magomed and Kalaev. All right, next one here. We have a ladies fight. Maria Bueno Silva taking on Montana De La Rosa. And in this one here, I am going to stick with Bueno Silva. I think that she is a slightly better mixed martial artist at least on the ground. Now, Montana De La Rosa does herself have eight submissions, no knockouts over 11 wins, but I think, honestly, Silva it looks a little bit better on the ground. She's gotten two submission arm bars against Jillian Robertson and Mara Romero Barello. Whereas we haven't actually seen a submission out of Montana now in a little while. Her last one was against Nadia Kasem back in 2019 and then she's had two losses since then including one win via split sorry unanimous decision okay so i honestly believe that because bueno silva is getting it done under the bright lights she's picking up more recent finishes i think she's the one to stick with also at seven and one rate isn't there for nothing she's a tough one to beat and i think she's going to go out and prove it on saturday sticking with maria bueno silva Next one here is going to be a very tough one at bantamweight because we have Pedro Munoz taking on Jimmy El Terror Rivera. And this one here, despite me having a little bit of a problem with the way Tiger Schulman fighters are in the cage, being maybe a little too aggressive, throwing too much caution to the wind, I think, honestly, he's going to be able to defeat Pedro. Uh, Pedro has looked good in the past, right? He had that upset victory over Cody Garbrandt, which put him on a crazy trajectory where he got to fight Aljo and Frankie Edgar. But he has proved he can't really do it at the biggest stage. His biggest win before that was Brett Johns and Brian Caraway. You know, he also beat Rob Fawn back in 2017 a while back, but I think he was given too much. I think it's too tall of an order for him to go in and fight the best Bantams in the world. And not that Jimmy Rivera, you know, hasn't had similar struggles, but he went out, he's beaten John Dodson, Cody Stamen recently, and while he does have losses to Peter Yan and Aljamain Sterling himself, I think that he has the better chance of fighting his way back up to a championship contender-like situation. While I have some issues with Tiger Schulman being too aggressive, I think it's going to honestly be too much for Munoz. As long as Rivera goes out there healthy, I see no other no other way but him walking away with a W. We're picking Rivera in this one. All right, this next one here, I have a pick in my heart, and I got the numbers pick. This is Angela Overkill Hill and Ashley Oder. So numbers straight up say Ashley Yoder, but I think we have a little bit of a red herring here. Angela Hill has lost her last two fights via split decision, and honestly, I thought she won these. I thought she beat Michelle Watterson, and I thought she beat Claudia Gedalia. I think that she was robbed, honestly, in both of those. They were close fights, but to give her losses in those are a little bit tough, and I thought she had honestly had beaten both of those women myself. So her numbers, I think, are skewed a bit too negatively. Now look over at Ashley Yoder. You know, she's had she's had her struggles. She's an eight and six fighter, is coming off of a win, is relatively talented, but I think that numbers here don't tell how talented Angela Hill is. Her striking is phenomenal, her grappling has gotten so much better. She's been training over Alliance MMA. And while I gotta stick with Yoder as the actual pick in this one, because we always go with the numbers, I'm gonna be honest here. I think Hill is the better call. This one is way too hard for me to say. This definitely will not be on Patreon. Just keep that in mind. It is really close on the numbers as well. Uh, So the numbers got Yoder. My heart has Hill. And honestly, I do expect Hill to win this one. But to contradict myself, I got to pick Yoder officially. So is what it is, Ashley Yoder. All right, going to the next one here, we have Macy Kiesen versus Marianne Renault. This one I think we had talked about a while back. We're sticking with Macy Kiesen in this one. Marianne Renault is just a little too old. Um, she's not doing it at a high level anymore. She has not had a win since Sarah McMahon in 2018. Macy Kiesen, yes, she was slightly derailed recently. She's now 6-1, and one, but I think she's a hot prospect. I think she learned from her mistake against Lena Landsberg. She obviously then bounced back against Shane Young. I think she's going to be able to beat a veteran like Renault. Pretty easily. We'll see how things play out, though. We're sticking with Kiesen. All right, this next one here. I want to like Alex the Great Hernandez, but I can't. I'm going with Tiago Moises in this one. This guy is coming off back-to-back wins against Bobby Green and Michael Johnson. And Alex Hernandez, despite beating Chris Gertzmarker, this guy struggles off and on. Goes in, beats Benil Dariush. Olivia Aubin Mercier and is ready to fight Donald Cerrone where he talks a bunch of shit and gets destroyed. 
comes back, bounces back, beats Francisco Ronaldo, talks, and play, well, I didn't quite have the same level of shit talking, but goes out, believes he's going to be able to defeat Jude Dober with his wrestling, ends up getting knocked out in the second round, and then comes back and knocks out Chris Sturz Martin. He's very off and on. This guy could be a huge talent in the UFC, but I don't think he's quite there yet, and we've seen Tiago doing it at a high level, carrying a win streak, beating guys like Michael Johnson and Bobby Green, who are not easy to beat. These guys usually decision make winning machines, and obviously Michael Johnson is a threat really everywhere, even though he himself is off and on. Uh, I'm I'm going to stick with Moises in this one. He's looked really good in his last two outings. We know that Alexander is uh, just off and on. He's not somebody you can count on, and he has not been able to string two wins together since 2018. So we're sticking with Tiago Moises in this one. All right, the next one here, we have Alexis Davis taking on Sabina, the Colombian Queen Mazo. And in this one here, I like Mazo. She's coming off of three wins in a row. She had the unanimous decision over Shayna Dobson. We had the split decision over J.J. Aldrich, but then goes and cements herself a solid victory over Justine Kish via rear naked choke in the third round. This woman is dangerous everywhere, and Alexis Davis is a longtime veteran of the sport, but she has struggled quite a bit. Three losses in a row, Shikagian, Maya, and Arujo hasn't had a win since Liz Carmouche via split decision back in 2017. And while she is also very talented on the ground, at 19 and 10, I cannot count on Alexis here. I think it's the young up-and-comer, the 23-year-old Colombian, Sabina Mazo is your call on Saturday. All right, next one here, we have a fairly uh, newcomer uh, here. William Knight has one fight in the UFC and then one in Dana White Contender Series. He went out and won both of those, obviously. That's why he's in the UFC. And he's going to be taking on Alonzo Menafield. Now, Menafield is a huge athletic specimen. I think this guy used to play football at Alabama, if I'm not mistaken. Let's actually look this up. My apologies. He played football at Texas A&M, but still a big D1 school. This guy has huge explosive ability, but he has proven that uh, mixed martial arts are still something he's working on. Lost to Ovin St. Prue, lost to Devin Clark, did go out and actually knock out uh, Paul Craig, but he seems to struggle if he can't get you out in the first round. This guy's had first round wins that range from about a few seconds in Dana White contender series to just a two or three minutes. Anything after that, it seems like his odds go down, and William Knight... Honestly, he is sort of a similar story. He gets a lot of people out very early, okay, but he has also taken guys to decision. He has been able to go the distance and get wins, and I think that's going to help him out here. Both these guys are highly explosive, and honestly, this fight could go either way. That's what happens when you put two guys like this in the cage together, but I think Knight has the experience, and even his young age is just 9-1 record. I think he has the experience that could help him out. Bear in mind, Menafield is only 9-2 himself. Um, let's see if Knight can go ahead and get this one to a decision victory. I believe he can. The Nightmare Knight is the pick. Moving on to the next one here, we have Vince Cachero, the Anomaly, taking on Ronnie Lawrence. So uh, this one's kind of a debut fight for the most part. The information we have for Cachero, or sorry, Ronnie, is off the Dana White Contender Series, but he does come out of the American Top Team organization, has looked decent in his debut, at least in Dana White, and then we've only seen the one fight for Cachero where he lost to Jamal Emmers. Um, looked okay coming out of LFA, but not only won one out of his last two fights there before he made it into the UFC, and honestly, I think this is a good fight for Ronnie to come out and win. I think that uh, we are going to be able to see Lawrence get a victory here. However, just uh, want to throw this out there. This, I think, is another one where the numbers don't tell everything because we have very limited information. The numbers right now pick Cachero, but I don't think that's enough to go on. I got to officially pick him, but I still like Ronnie in this one. So uh, just like we talked about with uh, Angela Hill, I think that that honestly is how things will play out. But officially, it's Cachero. All right, now our last one here. We have Dustin Jacoby taking on Maxim Grisham. And we don't have a lot of information in the UFC, but both these guys have fought at very high levels before. Grisham coming out of the PFL, Dustin fighting in Bellator uh, previously, and then making now his way to the UFC in the Dana White Contender Series. Both these guys have looked good, but I am going to give it to Grisham in this one. I think that he has a little bit better skills. His knockout, 16 over 31, um, whereas we just look at the 9 over 13. And really, it's not the number of knockouts I'm worried about. It's the number of fights. Um, Grinning Grishin has been knocked out three times over his eight losses. However, he just has all of that extra MMA experience. Both these guys are in their 30s at this point, so I don't think there's going to be a huge advantage for Jacoby age-wise there. And I believe that Grisham will be able to pick up a win in this one. He's going to be the call on Saturday. 
And then one last one here, we have Bruce Leroy taking on Kevin Kroom. And this one here, I actually do like Kroom. I'm going to go with him. We're obviously using the debut statistics here. Uh, we only see him in the UFC once. So, again, take this one with a grain of salt. But he has fought in Bellator before, did spend some time in LFA, uh, has bounced around quite a bit, and hopefully he can just capitalize on the opportunity. I do like Caceres, though. He has looked good in his last three outings. He's really uh, winning fights that uh, we're not really predicting him winning. So this guy might create another upset situation for us. But officially, it's Kevin Kroom. All right, to go over them one more time, we have Gain, Ankalaev, Bueno Silva, Rivera, Yoder, Moises, Mazo, Knight, Cachero, Grishin, and Kroom to round things out. All right, so we did another episode quite like we did uh, last week, and I hope you're enjoying just a little bit more uh, free, free-minded free banter, I guess, than me reading the uh, NPR stock reports. All right, so uh, it's a new kind of show. I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, please reach out to me if you are. If you're not, just reach out to me in general at MMAFightPick01 on Twitter, FightingSpurPodcast at gmail.com for email. And then, of course, you can head on over to the Patreon in the description box below. Click there and support the show at a financial amount that makes the most sense to you. All right, so we'll be back, of course, with all the best fight picks in the biz. We'll hopefully nail some Patreons this week, make you a little bit of money. I know it was a tough week last week for us. We just got to bounce back from it and keep things rocking and rolling. So until I speak with you again, happy fight picking.